For this next section, let's talk a little bit about the basics of several different infrared missions. So why do we need to go to space anyway? Well, there's two big reasons. Here's a plot of transmission as a function of wavelength. It's kind of cartoony, but you get the idea for how much of the different kinds of light make it down to the ground. If you're a gamma ray astronomer or an X-ray astronomer or a UV astronomer, you have no choice. You have to go to space because none of that makes it down to the ground. Visible light, of course, makes it down to the ground. If you pick your wavelength exactly right and you get to a very high, dry mountain, you can do some near-infrared astronomy. But it's tough. That mountain had better be very high and very dry. A lot of those absorption lines here are coming from carbon dioxide and water, things that you know we like having in our atmosphere. Um, but it's really tough to do infrared astronomy with all those bands in the way. So if you want to do something in the long wavelengths or something that's unobscured in the shorter infrared wavelengths, you do have to go to space. Radio, of course, makes it down to the ground, and you can do radio astronomy from the ground. So that's the first big reason why we have to go to space, is that the atmosphere absorbs infrared light. The other big reason is that space is cold. The best way that I can think of or that I've heard to explain this is observing in the infrared from a ground-based telescope is kind of like observing in the optical from a telescope made out of those long, thin, fluorescent tubes that are lit up. Because remember, if your telescope is on the ground with you, it's the same temperature as the air around you. And that's warm enough to glow in the infrared. So when you're observing in the infrared from the ground, it's really a challenge because you have to get rid of all the background that you get from the telescope, from the dome, from the air around you before you can figure out what bits of light are left over that are coming from space. It's tough. By getting up above the atmosphere, space is cold. And so your spacecraft can passively cool really efficiently. And you can be very, very sensitive to just little bits of infrared light. Turns out that we, by which I mean humanity, have launched a small fleet of infrared telescopes through the ages. And it turns out IPAC has had a hand in pretty much all of these. IRES was the first infrared satellite, and it was launched in 1983. IRTS and ACARI were Japanese missions. ISO was a European mission. MSX was a U.S. Air Force mission. Spitzer was a NASA mission, so is WISE. Herschel is a joint NASA and European mission. I'm going to focus mostly today on Spitzer and WISE, because that's what we're using for our project. So where do these spacecraft launch from? WISE, and for that matter, IRAS, launch from Vandenberg um, here in California. Spitzer launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida. And if you're curious, Herschel launched from French Guiana in South America. This is a picture of WISE's launch. WISE is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. It's entirely funded by NASA. It was launched, as they say, from Vandenberg in December 2009. IRAS and WISE had very similar orbits. You can kind of tell that because they were launched from the same location. So what's going on is that it's orbiting the Earth every hour and a half. And as it's moving along, it's always pointed outward. And it's, as it's moving along through the sky, it takes a series of pictures. So the little orange bits are the overlap between individual exposures. The next orbit is offset a little bit in this direction, but also a little bit in that direction. And in time, you have many orbits to cover the whole sky. Here's a movie that shows how it covers the whole sky. Earth is meant to be at the center of this, and as, it's, as the spacecraft orbits around, it is slowly precessing, and in doing so, it covers the whole sky. When doing this kind of orbit, it, the advantage is you do cover the whole sky. You cover the poles very well, because you hit the ecliptic poles on every orbit, but you cover the whole sky in six months. The disadvantage is that you do have to worry about where the moon is and where the Earth is because you're trying to keep your tele you're, you're trying to keep your telescope cold. And if you accidentally look at the Earth and the moon, this is a problem because you're going to warm up. So that dot in the center is meant to be representative of Earth, and as the the spacecraft orbit precesses, it slowly covers the whole sky. Another advantage to this orbit is it's below much of the radiation belt, so you don't have to worry too much about damage to your spacecraft from the radiation belts. For you orbit aficionados, this is called a sun-synchronous polar orbit. What this means is it is orbiting in perennial twilight. It is moving around following the sunrise-sunset terminator as it moves across the Earth. And it's orbiting at about that same frequency, at about the same cadence, so it's always in perennial twilight. So just for context, IRAS had a very similar orbit. It was a beryllium telescope that was cooled to 4 Kelvin with helium, and the entire telescope was inside this cryogen bath. When Spitzer was first proposed, 
well, IRAS seemed to work, so they put in the same proposal. But there was a whole bunch of budgetary drama, and through some very, very clever engineering, the engineers saved the mission. The telescope for the old design and the new design, totally identical. But here you have a much bigger spacecraft because you have to keep the whole telescope inside the cryogen bath. Here, the cryogen is outside and it gets vented past the telescope, keeping the telescope cool, but also enabling a much smaller spacecraft and a much lower launch weight. This is what Spitzer actually looked like. There's its solar panels that of course always point towards the sun. The silver side of the spacecraft is um, is on the sun side so that any little bits of heat and light that get past this, the solar panels get reflected from that side. The black side passively radiates off into space and very efficiently cooling the spacecraft. The instruments are in here. The cryogen, when we had cryogen, was in there. This is what the engineers call the actual spacecraft. It's the, the bus, right? It's, it's all the electronics, all of the, everything. Communications antenna is down there. But you can see it's not very big. I mean, those are regular sized people. It's not a very big spacecraft. WISE has an aluminum telescope, and it was cooled to below 12 Kelvin with solid hydrogen rather than liquid helium. It has similar sorts of design where you've got the solar panels that always point towards the sun, this, the telescope here, and the business end of all the electronics down here. So there's another cross-section of exactly what it looks like inside. You have uh, a dual-stage cryostat that helps keep everything cold, or did when there was cryogen still on board. So I keep mentioning cryogen. Cool is critical because you remember that you really want to get your spacecraft cold. If you're going to measure tiny little bits of light, a lot, tiny little bits of heat, you better have a very cold mirror and a very cold detectors and very cold telescope because you're trying to get just tiny little bits of infrared light. So the two missions that whose data we're going to be using are Spitzer and WISE. Spitzer was launched in August 2003 and it ran out of cryogen in May 2009. It had more than a five and a half year nominal lifespan. Now because of some really clever engineering we can continue to observe in the shortest two Iraq channels as warm Spitzer. WISE was launched in 2009 and it ran out of cryogen in September 2010. It was only about 10 months but that you know within that was the expectations and um, it too has taken advantage of some really clever engineering so that it can passively cool and continue to observe in the shortest two channels and it's and this rein, reincarnation is named NEOWISE R for NEOWISE reactivation. And again, it only has the shortest two channels. And we really have learned a lot about the engineering of these spacecraft since IRAS in 1983. And there's some really sophisticated engineering and thermodynamics that go into it. I only understand the tip of the iceberg, but it is fascinating. And being able to manage where the heat and the power and the sunlight go and how to get rid of that excess heat is really amazing. So just for context, how big are these mirrors? Well, there's me and Andrew, my son, for, for to scale, for Iras's mirror and Wise's mirror. These are not big mirrors. Spitzer's mirror is 85 centimeters, and it's bigger than either Iras or Wise. The granddaddy, though, is 3.5 meter Herschel mirror. Herschel observes in the longest wavelengths, and you can see because of this correlation between for the spatial resolution goes as 1.22 times the wavelength of light you're observing divided by the diameter. If you're going to observe in long wavelengths, you better have a big telescope if you want to resolve what's going on. And that's why Herschel has a big mirror. So wavelengths, just for context, there's the spectrum again. IRAS observes in this kind of regime. It had four channels, um, 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. Spitzer observed it had imaging and spectroscopy in three different instruments that went from 4.5 to 160 microns. WISE observed from 4.5 to 22 microns. And Herschel observed in very long wavelengths. It had multiple instruments on board as well. The warm Spitzer and warm WISE are just that shortest two, three and a half, four and a half microns. This is the logo for warm Spitzer. So just for comparison, HST Hubble is in low Earth orbit at an inclination that at least used to be reachable by the shuttle launching from Florida. That means it goes in and out of daylight every 90 minutes. It is well within the radiation belts and it is fairly close to the Earth. So knowing what you do now, does Hubble do a lot of infrared observing? Not really. It does near-infrared observing, but not very long wavelength because of these thermodynamic kinds of issues. So just for context, IRS had 62 pixels. I don't mean 62 pixels per wavelength. I mean 62 pixels total. 
as in if you worked with IRS data, you knew each pixel by name, as in, oh yeah, him, he's flaky, okay? You knew each pixel by name, because there are only two, only 62 pixels. I mean, your camera and your cell phone has megapixels. This had 62 pixels, but it revolutionized our understanding of the infrared sky. IRAS, because it has so few pixels, um, is really, really good at the big picture. It has relatively large pixels compared to the other missions we're talking about here. But it was the first time that anyone had ever observed the entire sky in these wavelengths. So in this all-sky image, I flattened it out here so the, our galactic plane is this ridge of bright stuff here. The dust that's left over in our solar system, left over from our formation, but also left over from asteroids and comets and collisions between asteroids, all that stuff, that there is dust in our solar system. And it is this funny S-shaped blue stuff here. So in, a, in, a, in astronomical images, blue corresponds to the shortest wavelength of, of light, not the coolest thing, the hottest thing. So of the wavelengths that are shown here, blue is 12 microns, and the dust that's in our solar system is pretty hot compared to a lot of other things. So that's why it shows up as blue. The galactic plane here it is, is warm, and so you see a lot of things at 60 microns and 100 microns from the galactic plane here. The reason it's this, the reason there's a diacal light, the R dust here is in this funny S shape, is because I've plotted this map so that the galactic plane is flat, but the ecliptic is not lined up with the galactic plane. And so in order to make the, the galactic plane flat, the ecliptic plane ends up in this projection looking like that funny S. So IRAS discovered a lot of things, but my fi I'll can tell you now about my favorite IRAS discovery. Now, if you believe Hollywood, you might think that astronomical discoveries or scientific discoveries in general sound like, Eureka, I found it! You know, the canonical jumping out of the bath, running down the street. In my experience, that is not how scientific discovery sounds. Scientific discovery sounds more like, huh, that's weird. That's exactly what happened with IRS. There are a bunch of bright stars that are always used to calibrate things. So when you have a new mission, a new telescope, a new instrument, the first thing you do is look at some of these calibration stars to try to calibrate your instrument. IRAS did exactly that. Some of them were way brighter than they thought. Huh, that's weird. They spent a long time trying to figure out why were some of these stars so much brighter than expectations. There were other stars that were totally right bang on where they expected, but why were this dozen so bright? Well, after a great deal of thought and a great deal of trying to understand if it was real or instrumental, they concluded that it indeed was real. It was a signature of dust around these other solar systems. They discovered that stars have disks. This is an artist's conception but it probably does actually bear quite a resemblance to what these stars really look like. Chunks of rock, lots of dust in rings around these other stars. This was one of those dozen stars that was first discovered with Spitzer. I mean, one of those dozen stars that was first discovered with IRAS. Beta Pictoris is only about 50 light years away, and it was a star that we knew about before IRAS flew, but we did not know that it had a disk. In order to find this disk in the optical, you have to put an occulting disk. You have to block out the light from that central star, and that's what that is. That's what those spider veins are. It's holding a disk to block out the light from the central star. And this is an optical image where they integrated for a long time. And sure enough, that disk around Beta Pictoris is there, and it is huge. But we had no idea that it was there before IRAS. There's a dozen stars like this. There's a dozen stars that IRAS discovered to have disks around them. This was revolutionary. People thought that they understood how stars and planets must form, but this was the first time people had evidence of disks around other stars. This was the leading edge of the revolution that continues today with Kepler and all these missions that are finding planets around other stars. This was the beginning of the revolution. We will definitely be talking more about star formation in other parts of this process.
But for now, since we're supposed to be in the context of this talk, thinking about how missions compare, let's look at this incredibly famous image from Hubble. This is, I think, the most popular image on the Hubble website, has been for a long time. It's the talons of the Eagle Nebula. And what's going on is you have a bright star somewhere up here that's putting out a lot of UV radiation and, and winds and blowing, pushing the stuff around in this nebula. And the little knots there, basically they're denser regions of the nebula that are taking longer for the light and the winds to push back. Uh, Hubble has a really tiny field of view. This is only about 1.2 arc minutes on the side, so it's really, really tiny. This is the same region of sky, but with Spitzer. There's that funny Hubble footprint again, but you see that Spitzer gets a much larger region. This image is 4.5, 8, 24, and 70 microns, and gives you a much better sense of what's going on in the entire complex here. So the 4.5 is blue, and the 70 microns is red, following astronomical convention, where the longest wavelength corresponds to the red light. So what you're seeing here is the 70 micron emission in the middle. And the way that these authors interpreted this was that there was a supernova explosion that has gone off in this region a long time ago, and that is part of what's pushing back the columns of matter in the, in the talons here. So when I hit the button, we will see what IRAS sees. IRAS is really good at the big picture, but not so good at the fine details. I promise you that's lined up. See? The bright part that's here and the dark, darker part that's there, you can see. It lines up, but IRAS, the pixels are huge. And, you know, so it, that's not really surprising. IRAS was the first all-sky infrared survey, and it did a tremendous job of giving us a sense of the big picture. But the details sometimes are lost for IRAS, which is why you have to fly missions like a Spitzer, so you can start to see the details of what's going on. So when I hit the button, then we're going to go into a Herschel view. So Herschel is even longer wavelengths. So here, 70 microns is the longest wavelength. But for Herschel, 70 microns is the shortest wavelength. This is 70, 160, and 250 microns. And the dust is between 10 and 40 Kelvin. So 70 microns here is blue. This is also lined up. You can see that Spitzer's 70 micron maps to Herschel's 70 micron. But Herschel has better spatial resolution at these longest wavelengths than Spitzer did at the longest wavelengths. And here you're seeing a lot fewer point sources. Here, for Spitzer, all those little blue things are point sources. For Herschel, you can kind of count the point sources that it has. There's not very many. Most of what you're seeing with Herschel is this interstellar medium. It's the clouds. So when I hit the button next, we're going to go to Wise. So there, as you can see, it's lined up. WISE is definitely blurrier. It has lower spatial resolution. The wavelengths are more comparable to Spitzer than to Herschel, but you can definitely see what's the, the features that are in common. The power of WISE, though, so for Herschel, that's kind of all the data there are in this region. For Spitzer, that's kind of all the data there are in this region. But for WISE, the data never stops. It just keeps going and going and going because WISE covered the whole sky. So there really isn't an end. It's lower spatial resolution, yes, but it's the whole sky. And that's why you need both kinds of missions. You need the kinds of missions that point at specific things like Spitzer and Herschel, but you also need the survey missions like IRAS and WISE to be a pathfinder to find out where it is that we should look for more interesting things and to put these in context, right? Because the, the idea that you get from just a tiny footprint on the talons of the Eagle Nebula might be very different than what you get if you study the entire region or if you study the entire ecosystem, the entire greater ecosystem of where this star forming region is and how it interacts with other star forming regions in the same spiral arm. So Spitzer is incredibly sensitive, even if it doesn't have very high spatial resolution. This is a tiny chunk of sky, two tiny chunks of sky, taken from a field called the Goods field. Even if you don't know what Goods is, um, you've heard of them. This is the, the this one patch of sky where we've invested lots and lots and lots of telescope time from many different facilities. And this is, one of them is known as the Hubble Deep Field. So you've heard of these people, even if you don't know the acronym. Here's a tiny piece of sky where there's something that you see in x-rays with Chandra, and there's nothing there at Hubble but Spitzer can see it. And here's another patch of sky showing the same thing. 
this press release was from, uh, you know, the, the science that went with this press release was that Spitzer was seeing the counterparts. But I find this image really, really useful for explaining what spatial resolution really means and why it matters. So for Hubble, you can see all of these galaxies have distinct shapes. There's edge-on spiral thingies, face-on spiral thingies, um, things that are more elliptical, long, thin. But look for Spitzer. It sees them, but they're pretty much all blobs of about the same size. And that's what I mean when I say the Spitzer spatial resolution is lower. Hubble has a much smaller field of view, but much higher spatial resolution. Spitzer has a much larger field of view, but much lower spatial resolution. It is, however, tremendously sensitive because it can see things that, you know, Hubble couldn't find a counterpart, but Spitzer could. So one of the, the aspects of this program that, you, you know, the skills that you're going to develop is understanding what is an image artifact and what isn't. So in this picture of a high school football game, you know intuitively, without my having to explain it to you, that these very bright, bright lights do not really have spikes coming off of them or giant purple wings extending in this direction. You know that intuitively. You know from your experience to ignore those image artifacts. We need to develop the same kind of intuition when it comes to astronomical images. Those purple blobs and the streaks is how the camera and the detector inside your camera responds to this lighting situation. And similar things happen with astronomical cameras. You have to worry about what exactly the light is doing on the way to your detector. It has to go through the telescope, through the instrument, and onto the detectors. And all of that system combined responds to bright lights in a particular predictable way. And when you have a very bright light source, those features become much more obvious and more prominent, just like they do in this picture of the football game. So the resolution and the sensitivity really do matter. And we've gotten into some of this in the spring when we we're working with the resolution worksheet. But you do need to think about, you know, how images of the same object change when you look at earlier missions or more recent missions. When it comes to the pixel size, the shapes of the structures in the images, the faintest thing you can see in the images. In, in, in practice, what we're going to need to worry about in our project is that WISE has a very different spatial resolution than Spitzer or 2MASS, and we have a lot of sources in our field. So this is going to matter for us. And this is just one example of how resolution matters. This is the same patch of sky. Here we have along the top WISE, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you can see WISE 1 and WISE 2 have pretty comparable for spatial resolutions, 12 mic microns is a little bit worse, and 20 microns is much worse. The PSF is much larger. There's J, H, and K. There's POS blue, red, and infrared. And then there's Sloan. So this thing looks like a point source to WISE. There's nothing in those images that really indicates it being anything other than an isolated point source. But when you look with higher spatial resolution, even though it's a different wavelength for Sloan, it's very clearly a little edge-on galaxy. So now let's go through some overview of the WISE timeline and the different data releases because once I let you guys fledge out of the nest and send you loose on the world to do your own um, research with the WISE data, you're going to need to think about which data releases are which. So this, this movie shows how WISE covered the entire sky. So this is a galactic plane map again, so the galactic plane is there and it is slowly mapping out the entire sky. Here we have time increasing here and it's filling up, it's mapping the entire sky. So it does do the entire sky, it covers the entire sky. Um, so just for context, because it's going to make a big difference in a second, in 2009, in December, is when WISE launched. The survey officially started in January 2010. They finished their first pass on the sky six months later. Then the cryogen started to run out. And so there was no more 22 micron data. Um, there was a little brief six or eight week window in which you could have just three bands of, of WISE data. And then when the cryo finished running out, you have just two bands left. And that first post-cryo survey was called NEOWISE. NEOWISE is Near Earth Objects WISE. Because WISE is really, really good at finding space rocks. And it matters if the space rock is going to hit us. So that was why it was funded initially to do this two-band survey. But we ran out of money in February 2011, so the spacecraft was put into hibernation. 
Then they went and found more money to keep going with the survey for near-Earth objects because it really does matter if the rocks are going to hit us. So it, the spacecraft was woken up again in, uh, 13, in 2013, and the spacecraft had to have time to cool off again. Um, but then it began its second post-cryo survey, which is called the Reactivated NEOWISE. And it, like the original NEOWISE, is funded by the Planetary Division. And so because they're looking for moving objects, they're looking for these rocks. Um, and the last big data release was um, had to do with all the data that were taken largely in 2014, and it was just released a couple of weeks ago. So this is a graphic that shows that um, the all sky survey was corresponds to when all four channels were operating. There's 3.4, 4.6, 12, and 22 microns for those four colors. When the cryogen started to run out, 22 microns didn't work anymore. We had three bands. Then when the cryogen finished running out, there was no 12 microns. It's just those two bands. The all wise data release covers everything, all the data that were taken in 2010 to 2011. So all of that was combined, summed up. Did, you know, they did photometry on it, made mosaics, and released it. The Neowise reactivation from this first data release that has just happened is just those first two channels, and because they're looking for moving objects, it's not summed up. So the data sets, when you go into URSA tools to try to pick which data set you want, the one, one data set you can still get access to is the preliminary data release, but that really is obsolete data. You shouldn't use it unless you're absolutely sure you know what you're doing. Um, the all sky four band cryo release is just the four band data. The three band cryo release is just those six weeks where there were three band. The post cryo two band is just the two band data from that time. But what you probably want for targets that are not moving, inertial targets is the all wise data release. All wise is all of the wise data prior to 2011 in February, those, which is when it was first hibernated, all summed up. And so for most of what we're doing, we're using the all wise release. The most recent release is the reactivated NEOWISE. This is just two band and it's everything from the first year of the reactivated mission. Um, so as we were talking earlier, it covers the sky with a series of exposures. The next orbit is offset a little bit. NEOWISE only releases the individual exposures because they're interested in the moving object. So they don't care about summing it all up. They don't, that's not their scientific goal. So the all sky release has everything, has the atlas images, which are all the exposures summed up into mosaics and the photometry from those atlas images, the individual exposures and the photometry from the exposures. Three band cryo also has all of that. Two band post cryo, because it was funded to look for near earth objects, doesn't have the summed up data, just has the exposures and the photometry from the exposures. The all wise release though, that took everything, all the data that had been taken to that point and summed it up. And, and so they have the atlas images and the photometry from those atlas images. The exposures aren't released though, because they've already been released in the context of all of these other releases. And this NEOWISE R, this reactivated NEOWISE, again, doesn't have the summed up data. It's just the individual exposures. We're trying to get money to sum up all the data, but we don't have that money at this time. So this is what happens when you sum up data that has moving objects in it. Here, this one is moving really fast. This is a really close rock to Earth. So it's seen as a streak. Here, this is a slower moving rock, but you can see, it's, this one is an enlargement of this. You can see the individual exposures you know, summed up, the rock is there. Here's another one, the rock is moving along. You can take, see the individual exposures. So what WISE has found a lot. This is a movie showing WISE's observations of all sorts of things. The blue dots are the known planets. The black dots are new main belt asteroids that WISE has discovered. The green dots are the known near-Earth objects but that consist of both asteroids and comets. The red dots are new discoveries from WISE. The turquoise dots are the known comets, and the yellow squares are the new comets. So you can see as, you know, WISE, as it's orbiting the Earth, is, is orbiting the Sun, it's mapping out the sky, but of course these things move, they're orbiting. And so even in six months, it's not going to catch absolutely everything. It's going to catch everything on the inertial sky, but it's not going to catch everything in the solar system because these things move. So that's another really good reason why why it should continue to be funded is because in order to see these rocks as they're moving, you do need to keep looking. So this is, I think, the first year of WISE operations. You, I think right here was when it ran out of cryo. You can see the discoveries uh, fall off as the sensitivity is decreasing.
but it's discovered a huge, huge number of things. So the traditional WISE mission, the original WISE mission, had 20 new comets, more than 33,000 new asteroids from the main belt, 145 near-Earth objects, 26 potentially hazardous asteroids, things that are Earth-crossing orbits, and they discovered Earth's first known Trojan asteroid. Trojan asteroids are things, are clumps of, um, of rock that rotate uh, with the planets ahead and behind the orbit, of, you know, ahead and behind the planet in the orbit. Jupiter is the most famous um, planet to have Trojans. They have huge groups of Trojan asteroids ahead and behind uh, Jupiter in its orbit. Earth was not known to have Trojans. It was suspected, but not known. It's very difficult when you're sitting here on Earth to see the Trojans because in order to see them, you have to look really close to the sun. But Wise found Earth's first known Trojan. And the Neowise era, it's, I checked the other day, it's discovered more than 5,200 new objects, 178 new near-Earth asteroids, or near-Earth objects, which include 30 potentially hazardous asteroids and 21 comets. So one of the big discoveries from WISE is really making a census of the near-Earth asteroids. So this is a graphic that's meant to show the total inventory of objects. So things that are greater than a thousand meters and smaller down to less than a hundred meters. The ones that are filled out are known asteroids. In other words, they've been seen by WISE and other, other observatories and other observers. Um, before WISE, it was predicted that we had all, uh, we had a huge number of these things where it's indicated by the cyan outlines. The new predicted total based on WISE's observations are the green things. In other words, we've seen almost all the really big stuff and a decreasing fraction of the rocks as we go lower. But now we have a much lower in mass, but now we have a much better handle on how, what the total number is of these relatively big rocks. Here's the problem though, even an asteroid that's less than 100 meters can hurt a lot if it hits us. And so that's one of the reasons why they're continuing to observe.